you know, be back in church and honor the preacher and see our friends. Amen. And it's just such a blessing to do those things. But yeah. the greatest blessing was John's song tonight. Amen. That's a good one. Remind us. Amen. Glory to God. Love that. Just Love it. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Did you heard that song you sang Sunday? That was a good one too. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Laura sang too. Boy, I tell you what a blessing she was when she sang. I tell you what, God's been blessing us with some good folks. Amen. 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 Thank God for it. All right. Thank you, brother. Take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me to two passages of Scripture. Uh, one in Matthew chapter number 21. And the second in Mark chapter number 11. <clears throat> Matthew 21 and then also Mark chapter 11. Now, we are on the last leg of our study of the life of Christ. I have uh, figured it out that we've got about five or six Sundays, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Wednesdays rather, left before the end of the year. And so I have each one lined up with the, uh, with the uh, life of Christ as He ends His ministry here on the earth. And uh, so to, last uh, Wednesday night we talked about the Pharisees and uh, the hypocrites that they were, and that was lesson number 34. Tonight we're going to be talking about an, another interesting story that uh, you don't hear a lot about. In fact, I don't know that I've ever even heard anyone teach or preach on it. Uh, but it's the story of the cursed fig tree. And we're going to be talking about the day that Jesus cursed a fig tree. Now this happened during the Passion Week. And we're going to tell you how that fits into the story and how it relates to the, uh, to the week of the Lord's Passion. All right? First of all, Matthew chapter number 21. Let's look at verse number 18. Now in the morning as he returned into the city... He hungered, and when he saw a fig tree, this is the Lord, in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth uh, forward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive." So Matthew gives us that record uh, of, the, of the fig tree that was cursed. Then over in uh, Mark chapter 11, we have uh, what might be called the rest of the story on this. We have some gaps that need to be filled in, and so Mark fills those gaps in for us. Well, look at first verse 12, 13, and 14, all right? Mark 11, verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now if you would, look up at verse 20, over at verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you that whatsoever or whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall we believe that these things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. 
bizarre, okay, baffling, um, extreme, um, unusual. These are some of the words that I came across uh, written by commentators on these verses. There has been uh, some confusion down through uh, the history of, of, of the Bible and, and Christendom about this particular passage and how unusual it was for Jesus uh, to speak words of cursing to anything, anyone he never did, but to, uh, to a, a plant. And it just seemed all, it just seems, in fact, it's one of the few miracles performed by Christ during the last week of his life on this earth. And it's the only recorded miracle of Christ that ends in a negative way or with a negative outcome. And so it's the story of the cursed fig tree. And it's found uh, in two of the four Gospels, and we just read those in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. So we have this story of Jesus who has gone into Jerusalem. We studied a few weeks ago about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And uh, the people hail him as the Messiah. And we call that, or a lot of people call that Palm Sunday. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not real sure on the timeline there. It may have very well been Palm Saturday. But if you're going to have the Lord going to the cross on Wednesday, which is what I believe, then the time frame changes a little to what some would say it is. But uh, they call that Palm Sunday. Then they talk about the Lord coming back on Monday and cleansing the temple. So, so the story goes that Jesus came in, he's hailed as the Messiah. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, they throw their clothes uh, before him and palm leaves and say, Hosanna, Hosanna, he that comes in the name of the Lord. And there was a big to-do and thousands of people are involved in this. The, many have speculated there may have been uh, as many as 100,000 people uh, in for the feast, this big feast of Passover uh, during this time. And so there's a lot of Hustle and bustle, a lot of emotion going on. They expected Jesus to come in as a soldier, you remember? To take over and, and, and overcome the, the Roman captors and set up this kingdom. But, but that's not why Jesus came. He came to be the Savior. So, the first time. So, uh, they, they hail Him as the Messiah and then He leaves the party, if you would. Normally, a person who's... Uh, uh, put in such a position, uh, it's magnified in front of the people, would have a big party thrown and everybody would come and they would talk to him and there would be a lot of uh, drinking and fellowshipping, but no, Jesus didn't stay. And he left and he goes back to Bethany and spends the night at the house of Bethany, our house of Martha, Mark and, uh, Martha and uh, Mary and Lazarus. All right? Now, so... Uh, he spends the night and he comes back into Jerusalem the next morning and that's when he sees the fig tree. He's hungry, okay? And so uh, he, he gets to the tree and uh, expecting to find some figs. Now, I don't know about you, I like figs. I like fig preserves. And that's really good stuff, Amen. We had a fig tree in front of our house when we were living in uh, uh, Mississippi. And, uh, and so we was there a few years and we got some figs off of that. And I love figs. But I learned something about figs uh, for this story that I didn't know before. And I'll share that with you in just a minute. But Jesus comes and this is this fig tree and it's full of, fully leafed. And the leaves are already sprouting. Remember, we're talking about... Uh, a week that is in, in, in uh, late March, early April. Uh, and so it's going to be in the April area. And it's still early spring. And this, this, the tree is not yet in season, per se. Uh, that, it blooms and produces uh, a new figs sometimes in June and July. That's when it starts. That's the normal. But I'll tell you something here in just a moment that you may not have known. But Jesus went... And, and he was looking for figs, didn't find any figs. And um, I don't know about you, but when I miss breakfast, I get cranky. I'm not calling Jesus cranky, okay? 
but he expected to find some figs, something to eat. And when he didn't, he curses the fig tree. And in the, in the ear of the disciples, they heard him say, you know, let no man eat any fruit off of you anymore. And he cursed this fig tree. And so they, they go on their way. They're going into town, into Jerusalem. This time Jesus goes straight to the temple and cleanses the temple the second time. All right? And he does just like he did the first time, goes in there, turns tables over, runs, runs the changers out, and the animals and all that stuff, and, uh, and, and, and cleanses the temple. And it's during that time that the scribes and the Pharisees begin to question him about his authority, who gave you the authority to do all this, and, and who do you think you are, and all of that. And uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of lessons to be learned through those questions in that, during that time. But he gets through that, and he goes back outside of Jerusalem and back to Bethany to stay another night at uh, Lazarus' house. The next morning, he gets up and he comes back into Jerusalem, and they pass the tree again. And this time, Peter sees it, but it doesn't look like the same tree. In fact, it's withered from the roots I mean, it's just all the way down from the top to the bottom, leaves gone, all shriveled up, dried out, crumbly, uh, all the way to the roots. It's a, it, it has no life left in it. And, uh, and Peter makes mention of that. He said, Lord, here's the tree you curse. Look at it. And that's when Jesus uses that opportunity to share with Peter and the, and the rest of the disciples how important it is that, that we live by faith and not by sight. And that when we pray, that we ought to believe. And that God gives us what we need according to His will when we believe and pray. So, uh, these are in, this is a very important story, but it seems odd for Jesus to have done something like that. But there are some lessons here that are very important for us to know, especially in this time frame. Alright? Now, let me give you some things to think about. Uh, about this story. When I was telling you a little while ago about the fig trees and, and, and the, the normal new growth of figs, let me tell you something you may have never heard before. I hadn't learned this until I started studying this again. And, but, but fig trees are, were common. You know, they were everywhere. They were common and, and abundant. And even though the normal new growth of figs happened later in the spring, there was still these little edible figs that would show up on the old mature branches of the tree. And uh, when the tree began to leaf out in the spring, these little, uh, these, they, they were called, there was a name for them, the, the uh, Jews called them Breba, and uh, the Arabs called them Taksh. But they were these little bulbs about the size of an almond. Uh, that would be that would grow off of the older branches, and they were edible. They weren't as sweet and weren't as good as the big figs, but they were edible. Okay, and uh, and and they were and they were good. They was uh, uh, nutritious. And Jesus went expecting to find some of them little tacks, some of the little brebas on uh, on the tree. And when he didn't find them, didn't find fruit, he pronounced judgment on the tree. Now, I don't know about you, but, but uh, uh, you know, I get, uh, you know, like I said a moment ago, a little cranky when I don't have that breakfast. In fact, it's probably one of the three most favorite meals of the day for me. Amen. But uh, anyway, I like breakfast. But Jesus goes into town, and, he's been, and, and he didn't get, uh, he wasn't, look, all things, everything that God created, he created for his glory and his honor. His glory and His honor. That's the natural lesson here. The natural lesson in this is, is that we need to understand that, that this, this bush should have naturally produced in order to give pleasure to the Son of God. But it didn't. It didn't. And, and so it, 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 it fell under God's judgment. Think of the Garden of Eden for a moment. The reason that the Garden of Eden was a paradise was because every blade of grass, every little plant, every flower, every living thing in the garden 
was producing naturally the way God intended it to be. Naturally. And so naturally, the Lord had every right to expect the fig tree to have some figs on it, but the fig tree was not acting or producing naturally. How, does that, how, how did that happen? Why, does that, why did that happen? Well, because of sin. The fall of man, the fall of Adam changed everything, even in nature. Not only has sin infected mankind, sin has infected the natural world. You see, even nature itself groans. The world, this creation that God, the Bible says creation groaneth, you know, uh, for redemption. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Let me tell you the end game, the end result of a world, a fallen world that, 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 that does not operate naturally. Here's, and the Lord gives us this in Romans chapter 1. And it says in verse Saul, which is start in verse uh, 19 because, or 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they're without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible of man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affection. Listen to this. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And I want you to get that phrase. The natural progression of people who reject God and a nation and a world that rejects God is that it ends up doing everything against nature. Everything seems unseemly and unnatural. That's what homosexuality is. It's unnatural. It's unseemly. It's against nature. Men who and women who who uh, defile their bodies, it's unnatural. The way, the, the way uh, uh, that we act and carry on in this world against nature. And, and sin has caused that. And because of that, uh, things just don't work naturally the way they ought to anymore. That's sad. But there's another point of view in this story that I think there's a lesson for us to learn. Notice that Jesus spoke directly to the fig tree. Now, of course, we know that uh, that the fig tree is not a person, is not a living soul, but it's a living thing. And every living thing has the spirit of life. And all life comes from God. Amen? Amen. So every person, like every living thing, is created to bring honor and pleasure to God. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4. These are verses that I want you to underscore with your pen or put a check or a star by them because they're so important. Revelation chapter 4. And look with me in verse 11. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. And here's why He created all things. And for Thy pleasure they are and were created. The fig tree did not please Jesus, and Jesus was not honored by the fig tree, so Jesus placed a judgment on the tree. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to be pleased with me. I really do, don't you? And I want to bring honor to Him. I want to bring glory to Him. I really do. And I miss up so bad, and we all do because we're sinners, but, but the fact is that we ought to want in our heart to please Him. In fact, the one thing that we know pleases God the most is faith, right? 
Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. And so it's important that we do what we do on this earth so that we might please Him. Wherefore, therefore, what, or therefore, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Now, understand that some, as I've been reading commentators about this story, they'll say, well, preachers, uh, we need to take into account that, uh, uh, that this uh, fig tree was not, uh, was not, had, didn't have the figs because uh, it was out of season. But then I'm reminded that we're still to be faithful in season and out of season. And we're still uh, supposed to please the Lord in season and out of season. Amen. So there's that point of view. But there's another point of view that I will look at that's important also. Go with me to Hosea chapter 9. Let's look at the prophetical point of view on this story. Find the book of Hosea. It's It's in there. Find Amos and go backwards, all right? You'll find Joel behind that or before that and then Hosea. In Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10, we learn something about the nation of Israel. And, um, and I know you've heard it, but here's a verse that confirms it. The Lord said this in verse 10, Hosea 9 and verse 10. He said, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor, that's an idol, and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. And so God was saying there was so much hope for Israel in the beginning, like a beautiful fig tree or like a grapevine. And the Lord had great pleasure in it in the beginning, but they they turned away from God and went in another direction. And in Jeremiah, if you'll pull, pull back to Jeremiah, head back toward the book of Psalms and Proverbs, you'll see Jeremiah, you see Isaiah. But Pro, uh, Jeremiah 8 and verse number 13. And Jeremiah was uh, a prophet that prophesied about the Babylonian captivity. And here, here's what he had to say about that in, in Jeremiah 8 verse 13. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. And the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. So, Jesus, or God rather, loves His people. The Israelites are God's chosen people, and He likens them unto a fig tree. But... But right now, Israel is not in a good place with God. You know, they're just not. We should pray for the peace of of Jerusalem. We should pray for Israelites. We should pray that they see uh, Jesus as the Messiah. But right now, they don't. Generally speaking, they have rejected Him as a nation. They have rejected Him. That's why they're still looking. And that's why they'll accept the Antichrist so readily. Because uh, they rejected Jesus, the true uh, Christ. So, but they look good, you know. They look good, but they're empty. And they're fruitless. And they're blinded by their own foolish pride. And because of that, Jesus, or God rather, has rejected Israel. And he's turned to the Gentiles. Now understand, we're living in the age of grace. And really, it could also be called the age of the Gentiles. We're not Jews, we're Gentiles. A Gentile was any non-Jewish person. So, we're not Jews, we're Gentiles. And thank God that God has turned away from Israel for a season so that He might go after the Gentile. That's what Jesus now came, not just to save the Jew, but the Gentile. Paul said it like this, I'm not ashamed. Romans 1.16 of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Gentile. So, uh, so the Lord has right now turned away from Israel. Uh, now, we know that when the Lord gathers us out, that age of grace will be gone over. The times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And, and this world will be plunged into a tribulation period that has one purpose. And that is to get the attention of Israel. And God's going to deal with them. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. 
And he's going to deal with them in a very harsh and stern way so that at the end of that seven-year period, they'll behold Jesus and accept him as the, as the true Messiah. Amen? And right now, they, they, they've not done that. And, and they've turned away from God. Go with me to Mark chapter number 13. Mark 13 talks about this situation. In Mark 13, verse 28, the Lord gave the, uh, this parable. He said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see those things, these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed and watch and pray, for ye know not when this time or when the time is. And this is... Uh, this was given during the Olivet Discourse and where they were asking him questions about the future of Israel. And he said there'll come a time when God will deal with his people. They're, they're pretty. They're, they got some leaves. They look okay, but they're empty and, uh, and fruitless. Now, there's one more lesson I want you to learn on this tonight also, and that is the practical point of view on this. There's a practical lesson here that I think we all need uh, to learn, and that is this: every person, every one of us, someday, just like Jesus and the fig tree, fig tree had a had a meeting, we're going to have a meeting with Jesus someday, right? All of us, every person that's ever lived is going to either stand before God the Father at the great white throne judgment, or he's going to stand. All the saved are going to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, right? And we're going to have to give an account of our lives. And, uh, and we're going to have to prove our stewardship. And God's going to hold us accountable for what He's given us here on this earth. Those of us who are saved, we'll, we'll give an account for our service. The great white throne judgment will be all about uh, giving an account of rejection. How these people rejected the Lord. And it, their name will not be found in the book and they'll be cast into hell. That's sad, isn't it? But we're all going to stand before the Lord someday and give an account. Just like that, that little fig tree did, we also will have to do the same. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians, or yeah, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, verse number 10. And the Bible says clearly, For we must all, that's all believers, we must all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And so we're going to have to give an account for our, uh, for our own little, our little fig tree life. Amen. Now, understand that Jesus, Jesus chose us. John 15, 16 says, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. We're to be fruitful Christians. Now, there's two kind of fruit, and, I, and I'm almost done. There's two kind of fruit that I think the Lord wants to find on us, okay? First, there's the fruit of the Spirit. All right, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God wants to find that on us when we stand before Him. We want to, he, I, I, I trust that our testimony that we'll be able to, that our lives will be a testimony of these things. Peace, love, joy, gentleness. But also the fruit of a Christian or the fruit of the righteous. In Proverbs 11.30 says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. So the fruit of the Spirit is, is God working in us all these wonderful virtues. And we're able to show those to other people. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. But also, God expects that we, as a, as a fruit-bearing tree, would also produce other Christians. That we could be seeing other Christians born uh, into the king, or other people born into the kingdom of God. Amen? We're to be soul winners. 
and we're to tell others about the Lord. So that's a very important lesson. Amen. Someday we're going to have to give an account of God for that. And I, I know, I, I think about it often, but I hope that I don't stand before Him with blood on my hands. I hope I'm, I can be able to say, hey, I've, I've done my best to tell everybody I know about Jesus. And I hope that you're doing that too. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again, Lord, for your word. And Father, I pray tonight that you might help us to be fruit-bearing Christians. Help us. We know, God, that you've ordained us to such, that we're not to be fruitless, but fruitful. And God, I pray that others might see love and joy and peace in our lives and long-suffering and meekness and temperance. And that they might also see us uh, winning other people to the Lord and bearing fruit as a Christian. And Lord, I pray tonight that you, that Lord, you would prepare our hearts that we might in these last days be found faithful and fruitful. And we'll thank you, Lord, for it. With heads bowed and eyes closed tonight,